to Hebrews chapter 11. We are on verse 7. We're going to be talking about Noah tonight. This is probably my favorite of chapter of Hebrews 11. I just love uh, dealing with this particular verse. I love the way the Bible lays it out, uh, the way he presents it. Uh, just a great lesson in the life of Noah that I think that um, it's easy to see once we kind of break the verse down and take a look at it. And so tonight we're going to look at that. And he says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet uh, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. The account of Noah takes place, it begins prior to the flood, and then obviously extends beyond the flood, during the flood and beyond the flood. And, um, and so what we find when we look at this is we see that Noah clearly plays a significant part in the history of the world. I mean the history of mankind. Every individual in existence today has somehow, somewhere came through the lineage of Noah. All right. Um, quite possibly, you know, when we talk about everybody goes back to Adam, and they do, but quite possibly uh, some of the children of Adam, um, their heritage may have been completely and totally wiped out at the flood. It's quite possible that the heritage of Cain was completely and totally wiped out at the flood. Uh, I do not know the wives that Noah's sons married, um, so there's no way of knowing that, um, but... We do know that as far as the sons are concerned, they are through Noah, which would bring them through the lineage of Shem, all right? Uh, not Shem, uh, Seth, through the lineage of Seth, all right? But we don't know about the other children of Adam. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing to me. But regardless, we know everybody traces back to Noah and through one of his three sons, whether it be Shem, Ham, or Japheth. And uh, all of them occupied different parts of the world. I think it's kind of interesting, this Hebrews 11. I did not realize this at the time. But where we are in our Sunday school lessons, it's like we just keep paralleling my Sunday school lesson. And I don't mean to do that, but it just it, it is where it is. Hopefully at some point in time that that will kind of stop. But uh, at this point, it just seems like it just keeps paralleling it. But we're not looking at the life of Noah necessarily. What we want to look at is we want to look at his faith. And that's the issue in Hebrews chapter 11, why he is on this list of those who are the faithful, all right? This hall of fame, if you want to call it that. Why is he on there? I want you to imagine the faith that Noah had to express for him to do what he did. I mean, he lived during a time where most people had completely and totally rebelled against God, turned against God to the point where God was done and ready to destroy the entire world. And yet in the midst of that, Noah was a man who clearly stayed his course and stayed focused on God and what God would have him to do. In fact, we find that um, uh, according to Genesis 6-3, at the time that he calls him out to do the ark, build the ark and all of that. Just prior to that, it says in Genesis 6, 3, yet his days shall be 120 years. What it's telling us is, listen, 120 years from that time, um, he needed to build an ark. All right, so he had 120 years to put this thing together. 120 years to gather up the animals. 120 years to gather up all the food. 120 years to make it work. All right, to do everything God had called him to do. He had 120 years to establish this. And, and that's an interesting thing because he was the only one that seemed to believe this to be true. Now, there were some that maybe would have believed him had they lived or had God left him on the earth. Enoch walked with God, so I would imagine Enoch, had he lived up until that moment in time, would likely have gotten on the ark with Noah. Uh, it's possible that Methuselah would have done the same thing, but Methuselah died probably the year that it rained. And, uh, and so, you know, all through that time, Methuselah was alive. But we, um, we, we don't have any reason to believe that anyone in all the world, really, who lived up until that moment, um, believed him or trusted that, listen, God's really going to do this. You know, Noah, what Noah's doing, a lot of them are probably making fun of him and teasing him and thinking it's the most nonsense thing they'd ever seen in their entire life. Yet it didn't uh, dissuade him. He continued to do the work, continued uh, to work on the ark, to build the ark. And so that's what he did. And he did so because of his faith. He believed 
God and trusted what God had to say. Imagine a world that was so corrupt that only one family believed God, believed in God and trusted what God had to say. If you were the only person in the world, you, your wife or your husband, whatever, and your children, only family in the entire world that believed that this Bible was the word of God and that God had given it to us and we needed to abide by it, how difficult would that be to stand all alone? You know, it's not to say you wouldn't, but how difficult would it be when the entire world is dead set against you and dead set against what you have to say? That's Noah. That's where Noah was. Uh, because the only ones that got on the ark was his family. Had anybody else believed him, they'd have got on the ark with him. Had anyone else accepted it or trusted it, they would have gotten in line with him and, and helped him do the things that he did. But there wasn't. Let me read the account for you in Genesis so that we can kind of get a real good idea of all of this. Genesis chapter 6, verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah and then um, in verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. That's the same thing with hear about Enoch, wasn't it? They walked with God. In the case of Enoch, he walked with God, and God took him out without facing death. In the case of Noah, he walked with God, and God put him on an ark and rescued him when all the rest of the world was destroyed. Both cases, these individuals were saved from judgment. They were saved from the judgment. So that's what takes place in their lives. But in the case of in the case of Noah, it just seems like a really interesting thing. When you jump down, God then gives Noah some instructions on building the ark. We're not going to deal with all of that. But in verse 22, thus did Noah according to all God commanded him, so did he. So what we find is everything God said to do. God said, I want you to make the ark. I want you to do it like this. And uh, this is exactly how I want to prepare. And then I want you to go gather up these animals. And, and I want you to do all these things. And it says, whatever God told him to do, he did it. Truly walked with the Lord. You know, if we were to be truly honest with ourselves, have we done everything in our life that God has ever told us to do? You know, have we really been faithful to say, God, you tell me to do it and I'm doing it. God, you have me to do this, I'm going to do it. God, whatever it is you want of me, I'm doing it. And... Um, and, and quite frankly, I would say not a one of us here have been that faithful. And so what we find in the case of Noah, it says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him. Not some, all. Um, when you think of Noah's faith, I mean, you have to think uh, beyond just simply believing the prophecy. God said it's going to flood. It, it, you have to believe that this went even beyond that. And you have to think about his faith. Uh, the kind of faith that it took for him to believe God and uh, that would give him the ability to you know, believe him in such a way that he would build an ark during a day and time where it has never rained. It would be a new and miraculous thing that they've never experienced, and it's going to rain to the degree that it's going to flood the entire world. But he believed him, so I'm going to build an ark. To gather up the animals, to gather up the materials, to gather up, when I say the materials, all the wood and everything that it took to build the ark, to gather up all the, the food and resources and to do all the things that needed to be done and to be able to bring all these things together, um, I got to tell you, that's a faith beyond a faith. I mean, it's more than just there's a prophecy that's going to flood, but God wants me to be the one responsible for doing all of these things. Um, I had shared in our Sunday school class about some of these things, um, just to give you an idea of what he was building, just so you can kind of get a grip on this. We had talked about the size of the ark. Um, the ark would be about the equivalent of, of a half again that of a football field. It would be a football field about 300 feet long. It was about 450 feet long. All right, so half again. Uh, football field about... 50 foot wide, um, and it's 75 foot wide. 
All right, so imagine a football field times another half. All right, half again is wide, half again is long. Now that's not all, it was three stories. So you got three floors that are this big. All right, now, now here, here he is. Now I don't know if he was a boat builder or not, I don't know if he had ever built a boat before, but my guess would be probably hadn't. And here he is, he's gonna build a ship. All right, he's gonna build an ark, he's gonna build a boat. Uh, big enough for all of this, and they're all going to trust his handiwork. If I tell you, if I tell you, listen, I've never built a car before. I've never, I've never worked on a car. I've never so much as changed the oil in a car. But I'm going to build a car, and you and I are going to drive from here to California in it. <laughs> Just something as minor as that, you're going to be looking at me like I got three heads. You go, I am not getting in that car. I'm not getting in the car. He's going to build a boat. That he's never built before because it's never rained before. Of course, they did have oceans. They could do ocean-bearing crafts. There's no reason why they wouldn't. But my guess would be he's never been involved in such a thing. And uh, especially the location he's in, you know, we're guessing that he's probably, probably over, you know, somewhere around Babylon. And so, he's, you know, the closest ocean would be he'd have to go down, I guess, to see from Babylon. He could go over to the Mediterranean or he could come south down to the Persian Gulf. All right. Now, I, if those things were even there, and keep in mind, all that's different may not even be like that anymore. So I don't know. I right? don't know where he's at. Can't even imagine where, how, how near the ocean would be to him. Doesn't matter. None of that matters. He's going to build a craft that big, gather up all the materials. He's going to do everything to keep that thing from sinking for a solid year. All right. It's going to be on the sea for a solid year with roughly 35,000 animals, eight people, and all the food and water it takes to take care of them. <laughs> that's faith that's what I'm trying to tell you it's faith um, that it takes to do that I want to share one other thought that it's not in my notes but I want to share this he only talks about Noah's faith Noah had a wife that went with him he had three sons and their wives that went with him um, they apparently did not yet have any children so all of them followed his leadership but it was Noah's faith that got them to do this. That was Noah's faith that God used in order to accomplish this. And I say that to say this, men, I'm going to single you out for a moment. You are the leaders of your home. Amen. Men, you have a responsibility to stand up and to be what God wants you to be. And, and so goes the husband, so goes the family. And it's really important. That's not to say a single mom can't get her household in order. I'm not trying to say they can't. I'm not trying to say that if dad doesn't get saved and has nothing to do with the church that, you know, a saved wife can't get her family in order. What I'm saying is, is when dad does what dad ought to do, when he follows the leadership of God, there is such a greater potential for that family to do and to be what God wants them to be. And I'm just throwing that out there. All right. So Noah did everything he was supposed to do. Right now, I'm going to break this passage down in a different way tonight than what I normally do because I've preached this passage a lot, and I'm not going to preach it, but I'm going to give you my preaching outline because I just think it's such a good outline of this passage, and I've preached it many times. I love preaching it, but I think it breaks it down in a really unique way, and I love the way it breaks it down, and I don't mean to claim that it's my own. I probably stole it from somebody, but I like it nonetheless. All right, so I'm not trying to take credit for this. I'm just trying to tell you it's a good outline. All right, let's begin. Uh, when we look at Noah's faith, the first thing I want you to see is the foundation of his faith. The foundation of his faith is this. It says being warned of God. The foundation of Noah's faith is in God's word. God said it. In fact, in Hebrews, it says, being warned of God, when we go back and read the text, as we said in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7, it says, and the Lord said. So what Noah does and the faith that Noah expresses begins with a very solid foundation, and that foundation is God said it, God's word. Our faith has to begin with God's word. That's where our faith lies. Our faith is in God's Word. My faith is in the fact that this Bible tells me what Jesus Christ did for me. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not an experience. It's based on what I've read in God's Word, and I believe it to be absolutely and totally true. My foundation 
is in this word, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. That's where I'm going to stand. Noah stood on what God said. Now, he didn't have the pages of the Bible like we have the pages of the Bible, but what he had was a direct call from God, and God said, Noah, and he told him what he wanted him to do. And based upon what God said, Noah's faith was put into action. All right? And I think a lot of people today somehow have the idea that our faith is somehow based on either a feeling or some divine interaction uh, or something of that nature. I've heard people say, well, I got saved because I saw a vision. I don't mean to doubt you. Salvation comes from hearing the word. The Bible's really, really clear on this in Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if I am to have faith, it's by the hearing of the word of God. I didn't, it's not because I saw a vision, all right? I saw the vision because of my medication, all right? It's not because I saw a vision that I'm saved. I, I want to tell you this too, it's not by an experience. I've seen so many things of what God has done. Oh, God can just do wonderful things. And I've seen how he has revived over here and revived over there. There's nowhere, 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 nowhere in Scripture where you ever see revival, you ever see faith expressed, you ever see salvation apart from the hearing of God's Word. That is the foundation, all right? So, you know, even when people make you think and make it seem like, man, something wonderful has happened here and something has taken place that has caused me to be saved, I'm going to tell you now the foundation of it is always in God's Word. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it can happen, that you've heard God's Word many, 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 many times and you come to realize, listen, I've got to stop running from this thing. And maybe God puts you in a situation where something does take place, something happens, but it's because of the foundation of God's Word that has already been presented to you that now you've got a foundation, and it's like you come back to that. This is what God said about salvation. This is how I know. I don't know about salvation except that God said it in His book. I don't know how to be saved except that God said it in His book. I don't know what Jesus said except that He said it in His book. I don't know what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, except that I read it in his book. The foundation for our faith is in God's word. In Noah, his faith began with, and God said, being warned of God. All right, so it started with his word. So the foundation of Noah's faith, God's word. The sphere of God's faith. And I find this is kind of an interesting thing. When I say the, the sphere, I think we forget and we tend to limit God in where and when we express our faith and how we express our faith. The sphere of Noah is this, of things not seen as of yet. His faith went beyond just his immediate uh, space, his immediate time frame, uh, beyond just those that he could see and, and know and all of that, the, the, the world that was immediately around him. His sphere of faith went far beyond that. Here's our, when I say that, I want you to look at it like this. When, in the case of Noah, he's looking 120 years ahead and believing that God's going to cause a flood 120 years from now. All right? So much so that he's willing to do whatever he needs to do to prepare for that flood that God says coming. So his sphere is 120 years away. All right? His sphere is also to the degree that he's thinking beyond himself. You know, there's a lot of people out here in this world. There's a lot of people that need to be saved. There's a lot of people that need to get on the ark. I would imagine from the very onset of all of this, he's probably thinking, I'm going to have to load up a bunch of folks. I don't imagine in his mind he's thinking there's only going to be eight people get on this ark. I would have to think that from the very beginning, he's thinking, man, look at all these people, and they're all going to die in this flood. I need to reach them. His fear was bigger than himself was bigger than even his time period. When we think about this, our faith needs to be bigger than where we are today. Amen. My faith needs to be beyond uh, me. And I'll be real honest, I, one of the big things that has really been, I, I just wanted, you know, I, you probably go through these moments in your life where certain things just like pound on you. Right now, and it's probably been this way for a year now for me, my focus is on my grandkids. What about them? It's beyond just me, all right? I, I'm at that point where I'm thinking, you know, what I do today 
will probably affect what my grandkids do. And I want them to be able to see me keep the faith. I want them to see me active. I want to see them to see me doing what I ought to do. Um, because I want to see way down the road, not just today. You guys, how many of y'all read the From the Pastor Sunday? Any of y'all, y'all, some of you? Folks, I write those so you'll read them, just for the record. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good one. And not because I wrote it, it's a good one because of the content. Let me, I'm going to tell you just because I think it's important for you to see. Talking about the sphere of things, back in 1997, a young girl invited a, and I wish I could remember who that young girl was because I cannot remember for the life of me. But that young girl invited a teenage friend by the name of Kim Gaskins. Invited Kim Gaskins to church. And Kim Gaskins came that Sunday, loved the youth group, went home. Her parents had been out of church a little bit, but looking for a church. And, uh, and so she went home and said, hey, I love that church I went to today. Why don't you guys come with me? And they said, sure, we'd love to do that. They, were, they had grown up. They were Baptists, always been part of a Baptist church. And they said, we've been looking for a church anyway. Let's check them out. All right. Within a few weeks, of, they visited. Within a few weeks, they joined. All right. Having joined... She then, somewhere during the course of time, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 2002, invited a friend of hers from work. Hey, we got this going on at church. Why don't you come? The friend that she had invited from work was named Diana Burnett. You know who Diana Burnett is. She's a member of our church. 2002, Diana Burnett, all right, at some point trusted Christ as her Savior. We baptized her, and she became a part of our church. Somewhere along the way she kind of fell out all right Uh, her husband's not saved by the way he'll be here Sunday for Dylan's baptism be praying that uh, God deal with his heart and life Um, but nonetheless she has got an entire family that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior she's the only one she's got kids that are lost she's got a husband that's lost and it discouraged her and she fell out to be quite frank about it come 2012 all right she gets back into church gets convicted of where, what she's been doing, where she's been at, and she recommits her life and has been faithful ever since, okay? Now, that having been said, immediately now she's concerned about her family in a little different way. Now it's not discouraging to the point where it's dragging her out. Now it's encouraging to the point where my kids can hear about Jesus Christ and maybe be saved, all right? I can't tell you the number of times we've visited with Kyle over and over again. 2021, Kyle trusts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He begins praying for his brother along with his mom. Uh, Two weeks ago, Dylan trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. We'll be baptizing him Sunday, this Sunday. Now, put all that together. 26 years ago, a little girl invited another little girl to church. For a family and friends day, by the way. Invited another little girl to church. Not knowing the outcome. But the sphere of her faith was bigger than she even realized. Because the sphere of her faith bled over into even another family. And, our, and that family is still today or just now really reaping the benefits of a little girl inviting a school friend in 1997. To me, I don't know about you, but man, that just, wow, that's powerful to me. And I think that I think about that and I think, you know, I think we underestimate sometimes how just some little something. And by the way, those, those are... Uh, That same family, that Gaskins family, just for the record, she also invited a neighbor by the name of Connie Peelman that came and trusted Jesus Christ. We baptized her. She was with us until she died. Um, They were also instrumental in the Loomis. They had invited the Loomis back 2000, but the Loomis were looking at that time and wound up going elsewhere, um, but remembered us. And when they're looking for a church again, where are they? They're here. They're actually a result of that Gaskin family as well. I'm just saying this to say that you invite that little girl to church, you pick that little girl up on the bus, you do whatever you do, and you do not know, you do not know what God's going to do with that. You don't know the sphere of all of that. The sphere of his faith was of things not yet seen. I just think that's so amazing. What I do today... I do not know the impact. It might make 100 years from now, 200 years from now. I don't know. You don't know. The sphere of the faith has to be beyond today. All right? Um, And I I love that picture. 
All right, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So you have to be able to do these things beyond just what you see. All right. Um, one last thing on that. I don't have the time for this, but one last thing. In John 14, 2, you guys know this verse in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. This is a verse on God's word. This is a verse where he says, this is what's going to happen to you. I've never seen heaven. Have you ever seen heaven? I've never seen that mansion. Yes, the sphere of my faith is that one day, and I don't even know when it might be, I'm going to see that mansion. I'm going to be there with Jesus Christ. Our faith is not just for today. Our, the sphere of our faith has to be for things we've not yet even, even seen. How about the character of Noah's faith? It says he was moved with fear. He was moved with fear. Now, when you think about the character of Noah's faith, and we think about this idea of being moved with fear, it's not the idea of I'm afraid, but partially it is. All right? It's the idea of understanding and knowing who God is, having a, having a reverence, having an awe, um, having that, that understanding of God's authority, His sovereignty, His holiness. All of this weighs in on the decisions that Noah's making and what Noah's doing. And it's a matter of saying, you know what? I know who God is. And knowing who God is, when He makes this promise, when He makes this prophecy, He's going to do it. So there is a respect and there is a reverence for who he is, but there is also a genuine fear for all of those who are going to reject him. I'm going to be real honest with you. It is a fear of mine, and I, and it, I wish I wouldn't do this, but it does trouble me. And it is that maybe one of my grandchildren won't trust Christ. My children have all trusted him. I don't have that concern. But my, my grandchildren are still little. I don't know what they'll do. You know, I, I've even got a, a grandchild that is grown that has not yet made that decision. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. Um, and I'll just tell you, there are, I know who God is. I know God's a just God also as much as he's a loving God. And if they die without trust in Jesus Christ, they'll, they'll split hell wide open. And I don't want that to happen. There is a genuine fear in my heart for that in the case of Noah, there is a fear in the sense of awe and reverence in who God is. But knowing who God is also instills a degree of fear in what will happen to those folks that don't trust him. People I love, people I care for. There is also evidence of Noah's faith. The evidence of Noah's faith is pretty simple. What would it be? His he prepared an ark. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it says he prepared an ark. All right, that's pretty, pretty good evidence, if I had to guess. All right? James 2.17 says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. I don't think there's any greater evidence in the case of Noah than the fact that he built the ark. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, what, just the fact that he, he built that ark tells me, here's a guy who had such an incredible amount of faith. You know, um, we, we evidence our faith every day by our actions. You know, I, we don't, it's funny, you know, you say, well, if I said, well, I don't think you really have that much faith, I'll be honest, I don't have to tell you that. We can figure that out on our own. If I'm not praying like I ought to be praying, it's a lack of faith. If I'm not studying God's word like I ought to be studying God's word, it's a lack of faith. If I'm not forgiving like I ought to forgive, it's a lack of faith. If I'm not as faithful to, to God's ministries and God's work like I ought to be, it's a lack of faith. You know, I'm not saying you're lost. I'm just saying that there is a lack of faith because God said, if you do these things, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to reward you. I believe that. Amen. I believe that. Amen. All right. And in believing that, I want to evidence my faith by doing what God said to do. And so if I decide not to do what God said to do, it's an obvious evidence of a lack of faith. You know, we as Baptists are pretty telltale. We really are. You know, we can, you can pretty well tell when we don't like what's being said or done. Our, our, I mean, we just, you know, we, we don't coddle those things. We, we just let it ride. I mean, we just let it show. You know, if pastor says something you don't like, you know, I know, I'm not done. I can figure it out. You know, I do the same thing. I'm a bad guy. I don't know how not to do it. But I'm just saying, if we don't, if we don't have faith, 
we're not going to do the things that God said to do because, quite frankly, we're not, there's not going to be any evidence of a faith that we really don't have. All right? So if we have true faith and the kind of faith that God wants us to have, we're going to do those things because that's the evidence of the fact that I believe what God said to be true. All right? Um, there is an issue of Noah's faith. And when I say that, there is something that really weighs heavy on Noah's mind. I've already kind of mentioned this, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But the issue is to the saving of his house. Now, I got to tell you, I love people and I want to see people come to know Christ. But my first and foremost obligations to my family, I want to see them more than any other. I want to see them come to know Christ. I want to see them serving the Lord. I want to see those things happening. So even though he preached to everybody, and even though he did all those things, spent 120 years building an ark, gathering up animals, food, and ultimately all of this because he wanted to save his family. Listen, this flood's coming. I believe it. I've got faith enough to know that it's happening. So if nobody else gets on board, I'm going to tell you this. Here's my issue. At least my family's going to get on there, and I'm going to see to it that my family's on there. All right. Now, he probably had brothers and sisters and uh, aunts and uncles and first one thing and another that, that wasn't on there. But he made sure his kids were on there. He made sure his wife was on there. He made a point of getting his family on there because it was important to him. So the issue of Noah's faith was to the saving of his house. Then there's the witness of his faith. Uh, by, he says, by the which he condemned the world. You know, we don't know in the Old Testament that he preached to people. It's in the New Testament that we find out he preached to them. And he did not preach prosperity doctrine. He did not preach, he did not preach that it was okay and we're tolerant of whatever your sin might be. He was the kind of preacher that people today would absolutely hate. He was your old-fashioned hellfire and brimstone. Listen, God's judgment is coming. You better get your life right. Amen. You know? And, and I got to tell you, I appreciate that. And I think that's so important that we preach. And There's a guy, Kelvin and I was talking about this, and Randy was in on it. We was talking about something that one of the pastors at our pastor's conference said yesterday. And, and you just don't hear much of this anymore. And... And he said this, he said, you know, he said, here we are, you know, so often we praise all of these uh, dancers and singers and performers and actors and you name it on TV. And, you know, they get all the accolades and they get all the praise and they're on there half dressed and sometimes not dressed at all and act anyway and behave anyway. He says, I'm going to tell you now, those are not the ones that ought to be praised. He says, well, who ought to be praised? Are those pretty young girls sitting on our pews that are wearing clothes that are modest, clothes that cover them up, clothes that are the kind of clothes you ought to wear out and about and people see you in so that you're not trying to draw people to your bodies. Rather, you're trying to draw them to the Lord. You need to praise those folks. And he is so right. He is so right. You know, we get it backwards sometimes. And when we praise those nasty, good-for-nothing singers that can't put clothes on, what happens is, is we tell our young people that that's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. All right? So what we find is the witness of Noah's faith was that he told them, judgment is coming. You better straighten up and repent and get on this ark. That was the message. I mean, he condemned the world. All right? He didn't preach anything positive. He preached condemnation. All right? Um, you know, the world gets pretty angry and violent when we preach the truth. You ever notice that? But he preached it just like that in a world that was already angry and violent. Um, then there are the rewards. And this is the last one. The rewards of Noah's faith. He says, and he became heir of the righteousness which is by faith righteousness which is by faith here is something we miss we say i wonder why all of that holiness is missing i wonder why the righteousness is missing in our churches in our society in our homes why are those things missing a lack of faith the righteousness comes with faith it is the reward God says, I will reward you as an heir of righteousness because of your faith, because you've trusted me. 
because you relied upon me. There is a reward that God gives us in that. By the way, we already read this, but in Genesis 6, 9, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. All of that was a result or a reward of his faith. There's a reward when we're faithful, and that reward is that we have a right relationship with God. We stand before God in righteousness, and He makes us right with Him. You say, how is that a reward? I'll tell you one sure way that's a reward is that if we're not very careful, you know, we hear people say, just follow your heart. If we're not very careful, we tend to follow an evil heart, but once we trust Jesus Christ and by faith follow Him, that same heart that once was an evil heart is now a heart that leans itself toward righteousness and the mind and heart of God. And, and so the reward is I can now make decisions and follow righteousness when before I couldn't. That's a great reward, more so than we could ever imagine. And so this is the faith of Noah. All right, any questions? I told you I wouldn't preach it, but I did kind of preach it. But. Well, that's nothing to do with our lesson, but um, it is a matter of faith. Because when Peter came to, when Peter came to Jesus, and, and they were talking about this man that had, had sinned so many times, and, and every time that he would seek forgiveness, uh, God told Peter, he said, you forgive him. And you remember he told him seven times seven. And Peter said, well, how often am I supposed to do that? And he said, seven times 70. And, um, and when he realized how big a deal that was, Peter's response was to Jesus, increase my faith, because he needed an increased faith in order to be able to forgive. And so that forgiveness can only come by increasing your faith. So when we're having trouble forgiving someone, to be quite honest with you, where we start is not in trying to forgive them. We need to start in increasing our faith. And by increasing our faith, we then have the ability to forgive. That's the idea. All right, bigger answer than that, but in a simplified form, that's kind of where it is. Yeah. And it's hard, it's hard, but it's, it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of increasing your faith. Yep, all right. I hope that was a good class tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Sorry I preached to you. I didn't mean to preach. It was a sermon. I can't help it. How do you not preach a sermon? All right, let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we, we love you and we thank you for the evening you've given us. Thank you for those that came out. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you'll lead and guide us tonight. Help us to understand uh, the things we've heard. And Lord God, help us to, to draw closer to you, become more of what you want us to be. May we be the faithful people that you would have us to be. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.